Warfare in Victoria 3 might be very simple when we compare it to some other previous Paradox titles. However, that still begs the question, how do we win our wars? Today we're going to look at exactly that. Every single war starts with a diplomatic play. In this case, I have just started the game as Prussia and I'm going to be launching a diplomatic play to humiliate Austria, thereby preventing them from opposing me in any other diplomatic plays for five years. And as this diplomatic play escalates, you'll want to start mobilizing your forces and deploying your army. So let's look here at the military tab and try and figure out what on earth is going on. In Victoria 3, armies are conglomerates of lots of units from a single single headquarters, a single area, and they are led by a single general. For example, in Poland, in the Polish HQ, we have 50 battalions in total, that is 50 barracks, and we have a general promoted to level 3. Generals are a key part of the army system. They come with specific character traits that can mean the difference between victory and defeat, and they'll be leading your armed forces, basically making all of the decisions that will be happening at the war front. Depending on the level of promotion of a general, they can command a certain number of units. At level one, they can command 20 regular battalions and 40 conscript battalions, and for each additional level, that goes up by another 20 regulars and 40 conscripts until finally at level 5 they are field marshals and can command 100 regular battalions and an additional 200 conscripts for a total of 300 troops. Now there's also something interesting which is how do I get more troops in a specific army? For example, here I have Brigadier General Helmuth and he is an expert offensive planner. This is one of the best traits your generals can have in the game. There is also expert defensive planner that gives you plus 30% defense. This one's going to give us plus 30% offense. And why that is going to be key is that the actual power, the statistics of your soldiers in the army will be what is crucial when it comes to victory or defeat. The actual number of forces you have bears a very minor impact uh, as long as you are within a certain range of the enemy, but I'll get to what I'm talking about there in just a little bit. For now, how can we increase the number of armies that Helmuth has and reduce the number of armies that Frederick has? Frederick here is direct, so they're popular and they're an experienced orator. None of this makes them a very good commander. However, they are the commander in chief so they currently have 43 of the total 50 battalions available in the North Germany HQ. What I can do is if I promote Helmuth as he goes up in level, that will increase the proportion of troops that are under his command until at level five, which is one level below the commander in chief here, they will get an almost 50-50 share of the armed forces here. Knowing this can be especially useful if you only have a single headquarters, but are facing a war on multiple fronts. For example, if I only owned the region of Poland, I could recruit another general in Poland here, and by doing that, it would split my forces between my field commander at level five and my new general, the Brigadier General Albrecht. And by promoting Albrecht, I could change that split around. So by moving things like this, you can control the granularity of the forces under your general's command. But let's say we're now in this diplomatic play and we want to begin mobilizing. When you mobilize your troops, that comes with additional cost. And if you're enjoying this video, please mobilize that like button. I've now clicked to mobilize these battalions here in the Rhine and by doing so, this has increased the goods input required by 60%. So each of these 25 battalions are now currently taking, due to the production methods, not just one artillery, one small arms, and one ammunition, but instead 1.6 of each, bringing the total consumption of each up to 40. This is going to have an impact on my market, not just meaning that I'm having to buy more of these guns and, and ammo and all of that, but also because I'm buying more and I haven't increased my supply, the price has increased as well. So when you mobilize your forces, you actually get a bit of a double whammy. Yes, you need more guns, but also you have to pay more for those guns as well. Conscripts are a little bit different to your regular battalions. You cannot build more conscript centers. That is all down to your national laws. If you change into national militia or mass conscription, you'll find you get quite a few more extra conscription centers pop up. But conscription can be a very, very cost-effective way of waging war. You see, conscription centers have absolutely no costs while your conscripts are not active, meaning that in peacetime, you have absolutely no 
no cost whatsoever to conscripts. However, if we are to activate conscripts during wartime, as I've just done in the Rhine here, well, you'll see that yes, this building becomes active, but also it is not immediately filled up. As you go past week by week, you will recruit more and more people. If you've got lots of peasants, then that's absolutely fantastic because they'll move straight from peasants into this, into the conscription center. But if you have an already full state, this means that people will move away from working in their factory jobs possibly and move towards these jobs instead, especially if they're paying a higher wage. This means it takes you longer to mobilize conscripts than it does to mobilize regular troops, which will mobilize in almost no time whatsoever. But you see with this Rhine army, it did take me slightly longer to mobilize. As the conscription centers continued to fill up, mobilization went on and on. And in fact, it is still ongoing every time a new battalion is created. Now that can be a real issue if you're trying to organize a specific type of uh, maneuver during a war, which is a naval invasion. So now that we've got our armies mobilized, what can we do with them? Well, general by general, we can select our armies and we can assign them to a specific front. At the moment, as you can see, I have no forces actually assigned here to this front with Austria, the Pomeranian South Tyrol front, but I do have 41 battalions on my side. That's because there are 41 garrison units from the Poland HQ currently taking part in this conflict. So even if you don't assign forces to a front, as long as they're standing by in that location, they will still contribute to that defense. But we can specifically assign other forces to another front. I can select my army here in the Rhine HQ and assign them to defend the Pomeranian front. When I do that, it will take them some time to arrive at this new destination. This is especially important if you're fighting a war across the entire surface of the earth, because it can take many, many weeks for an army to be recalled from a faraway front to defend your nation. So don't assume that it's a good idea to deploy all of your forces to a far-flung war if you then get invaded on the home front. Once you assign an army to a front, you can either assign them to defend a front and if you do so, that reduces the speed at which the enemy front will advance by an apparent 50%. But in doing so, you increase the attrition risk of those forces, meaning that it can be beneficial if you want to take the minimum casualties possible to actually set your troops to stand by in the location that you want them to defend. By setting your forces to advance front, they will accrue front advancement accumulation until they get to 100, at which point a battle like this will happen. In this case, this is a, a battle where the Austrians are on the offensive and we are defending. Now looking at this battle, we can see some interesting statistics. An attacker will have an offense and a defender will have a defense. Your armies will also have a morale. When the morale of a battalion reaches zero, they will disengage from the conflict and stop fighting this specific battle. Now, generally speaking, as long as you are not outnumbered at the front over four or five to one, and even then that's not a hard and fast number, you can win a war with many less troops than your enemy as long as you have higher offense and defense than your opponent. And as long as you have enough troops that the morale of your forces can recover between battles, you should be absolutely fine. Now, what on earth am I saying by this? Well, this was a fight that originally we were losing, but our defense is so overwhelmingly high that the enemy are simply not able to inflict as many casualties and not able to do enough morale damage to us, and we can successfully repulse them. Now, you of course want to get your offense and your defense as high as possible. How do we do that? Well, that all comes down to the production methods in your barracks and your conscripts. At the lowest level with irregular infantry, you'll get 10 offense and 15 defense. As you increase the level, you'll increase your offense and defense until you get to trench warfare, at which point something interesting starts happening. Your defense improves quite a lot more than your offense, and you'll also be slowing down the rate of conquest because the number of provinces captured or lost is reduced by 25%. Later on, this is removed when we get to squad infantry and finally mechanized infantry, which then have a massive increase at the rate they can capture, as well as equivalent offense and defense. But the general trend you'll find in your games is in the early game, lots and lots of territory will be lost in wars. When lots of forces have trench infantry, there will be very little actual movement of the fronts. 
and later on that will reverse again when we get to mechanized warfare. There is also the artillery support you bring along. This brings you more and more offense and defense along with higher kill rates and more devastation as you increase it. And of course all of this requires more and more goods consumption so you need a stronger and more healthy economy in order to deal with it. So we have skirmish infantry, as well as our artillery support being mobile infantry. If I look here at our overall stats then, we can see that this production method gives us plus 45 offense, plus 50 defense, and some other bonuses along with that. We can at any time before a war, go and look at an enemy force and see what their production methods are like. And this is the crucial factor you will need to do before you decide whether to engage in combat. So I'm going here to the capital state of Austria and I'm going to look at their armies. They have line infantry, which is slightly worse than ours. And they also have mobile artillery, which is equivalent. But this means they have a lower offense at plus 35 offense and a lower defense at plus 45 defense. This means that our troops are better than the Austrians, but this is only a marginal increase. How can we benefit from this? How can we make it last further? Well, an important thing you can do is you can improve the happiness of your armed forces. If you get your armed forces up to plus 10 loyalty, you get plus 15% offense and plus 15% defense. This is further double to plus 30% if the interest group is powerful, meaning it has clout above 20%. You can, if you're at five loyalty, easily get to plus another five loyalty by going over to your budget and smashing your military wages up to plus 30%. Yes, this is going to cost us a lot of extra money, but in doing this, we're going to get a whopping 30% additional offense and defense, which will change this war from being a current losing situation. As you can see here, I'm actually not doing very well. I was losing some of these engagements, but we're going to change all of that around now. We can now press our advantage. We will have a massive defense advantage over our enemy here, even without some fantastic traits on our generals. And that will mean, even though this apparent front is very bad, we're outnumbered two to one here, we will not be defeated consistently. And consistency here is the king because yes, you might lose some battles, but as long as you continue to get good overall engagements, you will repulse the enemy when they attempt to attack you and additionally push forwards into their territory. Occasionally, it is going to be the case that you get a bad engagement. Here I have 71 defense versus 34 offense and I am still losing. Yes, I'm not losing as many men. They are more men dying on the enemy side, but I am still going to be losing this fight. That can happen. And you simply have to hope that with a long enough period of time, you can win the day. And when I finally get my commander Helmuth here, who's got an additional plus 30% from his commander trait, expert offensive planner, I absolutely smash through any Austrian resistance. The dead on the other side are outnumbering ours over two to one. Again and again, as long as you hold fast with your techniques, as long as you continue to be able to fund your military, you should win battle after battle if you have the superior forces. This means that you do not need as many troops as an enemy in order to win the day. You see, the cost of this war for us has been dramatically lower than our enemy. Yes, our troops require more goods, so that does cost a lot, but we are running currently one unit for every two units the Austrians are running, and we are really, really pushing them back. Hovering over here, we can even see at this point what our average offense or defense is versus theirs. And once you start capturing territory, in no time at all, you will force your enemy to capitulate. One of the easiest ways to do this is to get your hands on the enemy capital. That generally forces their war exhaustion below zero and will push them out of any war. And this is how it's possible as Prussia here to defeat Austria in the early part of the game, even though they in theory outnumber us militarily over two to one. It's also important when you're deciding your war goals not to select something you are incapable of achieving. For example, if I were to attempt to conquer Austro-Bothnia up here and begin a diplomatic play against Russia, and in this play, not only have I set Austro-Bothnia, I've also attempted to conquer Arkhangelsk up here. Well, let's see how that's actually going to go for me. War breaks out and luckily there is no one except Russia that I'm going to be fighting. So yes, this should go pretty much all right. And as you can see, these battles are definitely going my way. I am conquering territory from the Russians here, whilst also repulsing their attempts at taking my territory. What you'll notice is that I cannot get their war support 
below zero. This is because they hold their capital and I have not occupied one of the war goals. It is paramount that you do not select war goals that you cannot achieve during the war. If you do that, you will be unable to prosecute the war properly and win it. And because if you can't get your enemy's war support below zero, the best you can probably hope for is a white piece, unless they are completely crumbling economically. In this case, I'm probably going to be the ones crumbling economically, I'm losing quite a bit of money and I'm already in debt. I cannot allow this war to go on for too long and therefore I have to be very sensible in choosing achievable war goals at the start of the war. Even with an unbeatable army, it is still possible for me to not win this war. But that brings us to our secret weapon, naval invasions. In the early game, naval invasions are very, very useful. But how do they work? Well, if you have a navy, you can select the naval invasion, pick a territory you want to attempt to invade, you can own and select an army to send off with that naval invasion. You can only assign an army which is from the same theater as that naval force you sent off. And you cannot send off an army that is currently involved in a battle. This means because my navy is based in the North German HQ, I could only send Field Marshal Helmuth or my commander in chief, Frederick here. But Frederick, as I said, was already engaged in a battle, so the only person I can send is Helmer. You'll then need to wait for the appropriate number of days. If there are enemy ships, they may attempt to engage your forces in a naval battle, which you can currently see is happening here. Unlike on land, having a distinct military advantage with your naval forces doesn't tend to be that helpful if you're outnumbered two to one being outnumbered is a significant disadvantage. If you lose the naval battle, well, that's it. The invasion was not a success, and because you lost a naval battle, you don't get to fight it again. It's important to know when we start looking at naval battles that supply can become a very large issue. If you're fighting on a front which is not directly connected by land to your territory where the HQ of that army is situated, you will be forced to use naval resupply. Naval resupply can be blockaded. And if it gets blockaded by your enemy, what will happen is that will reduce your maximum morale down to a certain number depending on the total efficiency of the enemy blockade. So if you're fighting on a far-flung continent and you are not able to defend the naval convoys taking supplies over to your forces, you'll quickly find your morale goes to zero and your troops will then instantly lose any battle that they are engaged with. This can be an absolute nightmare if you're trying to fight the British. The more your forces fight, the more they actually get to attack and defend, the better your commanders will become. Here, my leader Frederick has gone from being absolutely useless to an expert artillery commander. Arguably in the early game, this is a fantastic trait, much better than expert offensive planner because it gives you a plus 30 flat offense. This is currently putting my commander Frederick here at a total of 97 offense only a couple of years into the game, which is mind bogglingly high and it is completely shredding any hope of Russian resistance. In fact, his persistence attacks here are pushing us further and further north. And you'll notice that your commanders will generally attempt to move towards either A, your war goals, or B, the enemy capital, though you cannot predict exactly where they'll go. In this case, they are making a beeline north, generally speaking. As this happens, what you can sometimes have is multiple different fronts forming. When this does happen, this can be a little janky. Make sure that you send your commanders around to the right places and you only attack where you need to. Now all of this can get a little bonkers. Here I have Commander Frederick and he is winning against 182 other Russian troops. He's leading 26 battalions, but he is consistently, because of his superior forces, pushing them back again and again. And actually we managed to do so well that I succeeded in the goals, the lofty nonsensical goals that I wasn't really trying to make happen. As you wage war in a territory, you'll also add devastation to that territory. This increases mortality, reduces infrastructure, meaning it is hard for that state to be a part of the owning market, and decreases migration attraction. All of this should lead to massive population reduction in an area which is suffering from conflict. Once the fighting stops, this will tick down daily by 0.1% over time. But as you can tell, that is generally going to take quite a while in game to go back down to zero. A number of years, in fact. And if you've enjoyed this guide to warfare, and you'd like a beginner's guide to the rest of Victoria 3 in under 20 minutes, click the video on screen now.